up, everybody. Y'all gonna have to do better than that. What's up? What's up? Right. Um, thank you so much for having me. I need to uh, thank uh, the lovely folks at the Haven Center for Social Justice, for the study of social justice, uh, to Myra and Patrick and Laura, uh, to the crunk, uh, young, gifted black folk who took me out uh, for lunch today, uh, and to all of you for, um, in this community for the important work you're doing. I was here last year on March the 10th giving a talk. Wow. So apparently this is where I'm supposed to be every March. And I would like to say that I bring the sunshine with me. It was um, warm last year on March the 10th here randomly, and then here we go this year. So I'm thankful for that and to be in a warmer climate than New Jersey. Um, and I'm excited to share some of this work with you. So I want to talk just a few minutes uh, today about the what we might call the end of respectability. Uh, and where we may place ratchet politics. Uh, so one of the things I want to say uh, in getting started, uh, this is the more fun talk. Tomorrow I'm going to do the more serious talk about why the hell folks are killing black folks. Like, that's fun. Uh, and the police in particular, but people in our communities as well. Um, so I know that tensions are high. Uh, and if your tensions are not high, they should be. Um, you know, I know that this is a really tough moment, and I want to respect that I'm in a moment where a young black man has been killed by the police, a young unarmed black man, uh, and that that matters, uh, that it's traumatic, uh, and that, you know, that it continues to happen, uh, and that we shouldn't be okay, and that this is not just business as usual. So that's in my frame of reference and my thinking, even as I share with you what, you, what are some uh, seemingly more, perhaps, frivolous matters. Uh, because I'm a scholar of pop culture, because I think uh, pop culture tells us something about where we are in the culture more particularly. Uh, and also because I think, um, as the title of all of my talks uh, for this week um, are framed, you know, we've got to think about the pleasures of resistance. Um, so in the midst of trauma, in the midst of um, killing, in the midst of deep injustice, uh, and our own attempts to find our power around how we combat injustice. And look, it, it does seem daunting. Right, um, when the state says that, look, we kill you at will, won't care, and you can't stop us uh, in a place that is, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people, that is really tough to reconcile, to negotiate, um, no matter who you are. And even if you're black and you're like, we never believe that shit anyway, it's still tough to lose loved ones or people that you could see being your loved ones. And sometimes I don't think we should let our cynicism uh, and our rightful um, lack of faith in the American project mask the fact that it still hurts and it's still painful. Um, so I want to acknowledge all of that, even while I talk about some of the things that are more pleasurable in my work uh, and more fun, because I think um, that pleasure is also the work of justice and that part of the work of justice is about creating a world where Black folks and all folks can be fully human yeah. uh, and enjoy the full range of human experience. And so that means that we have to be able to talk about uh, some of the more ratchet things, too. Yeah. Um, so here we go. Uh, respectability politics is a term that gets tossed around a lot these days. Um, it's a set of practices that are under increasing scrutiny in this particular political moment. Um, frequently, we hear young 20-somethings, um, millennials, folks, uh, who are part of this new movement generation declaring that they will not submit to the demands of respectability either in their daily comportment or in their forms of political activism. Uh, instead, they have begun to mount a formidable challenge to civil rights era ideas about how freedom should be won, offering their own set of defiant countermeasures to challenge the sartorial and familial regula regulatory regimes that adhere in the notion of respectability. So it's a term that gets tossed around a lot, but I think that we need to ask, what exactly is respectability? Uh, and how do we define it? So um, I'm going to use Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's definition. She's an African-American women's historian who teaches at Harvard. She is the first person to apply this terminology to African-American uplift politics from the 19th century. And when we use that term, we're largely building on her work even though we don't frequently cite her name. And since part of my work is about saying that we should always give black women the credit for the intellectual labor they do, yeah. particularly around movement building, that it's very important uh, to cite her name, not just as scholarly practice, but as political practice, mm. right? 
So the politics of respectability, um, which she broke down in her book, Righteous Discontent from 1993, uh, constituted a counter discourse to the politics of prejudice. It entrusted to blacks themselves responsibility for constructing the public Negro self, a self presented to the world as worthy of respect. Respectability demanded that every individual in the black community assume responsibility for behavioral self-regulation and self-improvement along moral, educational, and economic lines. There could be no lapsing as far as sexual conduct, cleanliness, temperance, hard work, and politeness were concerned. There could be no transgression of society's norms. From the public spaces of trains and streets to the private spaces of their individual homes, the behavior of blacks was perceived as ever visible to the white gang. So when we're railing against respectability politics, I'm going to say more about what that looks like in today's moment in just a second. Let's remember that it comes out of a particular moment, a moment in the 19th century where the federal government had abandoned blacks in the South after Reconstruction. So during the Reconstruction era, right after the Civil War, there were troops demanding that black people get educated, get access to social services, uh, and, and have a fair amount of representation in politics. And then by 1877, when the North and South broke a compromise, uh, the hayes tilden Compromise of 1876, and pull out of the South, all of a sudden black people are abandoned. So we've given them, the government gave them freedom, but then uh, has now said, well, after 12 years, we're tired of enforcing that. We're sort of done with that. So we're ready to move on. So black folks are like, what the hell, right, is about to happen? And so they are like, well, look, we can't make the government defend us, protect us. But we can regulate ourselves. We can make white folks believe in us by pulling up our pants and being, you know, speaking good corporate English and getting good jobs, working hard, and getting married, and having two parent families, raising our children, committing no crimes. And if we do that, they'll see that we're capable of assimilation, that we're fit for this with this thing called American citizenship. Theorized primarily by black church women and black club women, <coughs> it, this, this policy, this politic became the cornerstone of what we know as racial uplift, uplift politics of the 19th century. So today, we are made to believe that if we fastidiously abide by the dictates of respectability, if we go to college, if we learn to speak good English, if we don't commit crime, if we have two parent heterosexual families, Right? Then we can simultaneously combat system, systematic racial oppression and mitigate the impact of systemic racism on our personal lives. So we think that it'll, we can do both, right? We can make sure that the system gets better, but even if it doesn't, we can make sure that its effects don't touch us. Right? Now, this seems reasonable if you find yourself in a place where you are 12 years out of slavery and the government has abandoned you. But racism is completely unreasonable in its magnitude, in its severity, in its intensity, in its persistence. It is unreasonable. It's unreasonable to kill Tony Robinson. Right? It's unreasonable to kill Anthony Hill, who was killed yesterday in Atlanta black man suffering from uh, mental disorder, naked. So he was naked. So we know that he wasn't armed because we could see. Mm. And they killed him anyway. And the cop had a taser, so had another option. Mm. Killed him anyway, right? That's unreasonable. But the other thing that's problematic about the politics of respectability is that it absolves the state of any overt responsibility to ameliorate race, ameliorate racism. So now, so that's the history lesson. Now I want to fast forward to another moment. And part of what I'm doing is trying to trace a genealogy for you of many things, respectability, politics, ratchetness, disrespectability. So anybody know where the sagging pants trend began? Got any idea? Come on, some of y'all weren't born. <laughs> 1996. <laughs> Some of y'all been around a little longer than that. All right. It starts here. 
This is a scene from John Singleton's 1991 film, Boys in the Hood. This is one of the earliest iterations that we have in visual culture of young black men sagging their pants. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the main characters in the film, they are not dressed this way. Even Ice Cube, no boy, <laughs> who you know now as like a family guy, but we know from NWA, right? Uh, it, you know, has his pants pulled up on the waist. So the sag, as far as I can call it, and what I can remember, I can remember a young white kid coming to class, I was in the sixth grade in 1991, uh, and saying, let's sag, you know, pulling his gym shorts around his waist and saying, we're gonna sag our pants like the, like the black boys do. And I was like, what are you gonna do? Because uh, I've always been crook, it did just uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, what do you mean? Like the black, you know, but, but they were talking about how they had seen it in this movie, this is circa 1991, so this is one of the earliest iterations that we see. And the question we have to ask is, why has this fashion trend lasted for 25 years? <laughs> this is the one fashion trend that has lasted for 25 years. Everything else has come, gone, and come again, because now people wear the hell like they were in 1991 too. Young black men wear the high top fades and do the whole thing, right? But that went away for a minute. Yeah. But this, this here, it has persisted. Now, What's interesting is that this has also become the subject to ticketing and fines in municipalities around the country. Uh, and frequently, this local legislation has been introduced by civil rights era African Americans who sit on city councils and declare that they are tired of looking at these young black men's behinds. Oh my God. <laughs> but that's a slogan for respectability politics. If you just pull up your pants, you too can go to college. <laughs> this is the argument, right? I mean, does anyone think that maybe these brothers are just trying to move people, just like, I'll show you, give you my ass to kids, right? Like, I'm talking, like, real talk. Like, maybe they are performing this sort of politics on the body um, and, and, a, and a sort of generation long disaffection with the system. I think that that's. Uh, a perfectly plausible argument, but I'm interested more in this as a genealogical matter. Um, and as an evidence of the fail, like the failure of this logic, and yet the pervasiveness of it and how it seems to be so common sense. <coughs> because what we know is that a graduation cap doesn't stop a bullet. Mm. One of the pictures we have of Michael Brown is with him in the Graduation yes. cap, just like that. Yeah. Mm. Did, did stop the bullet. Whatever your personal view of how high on the way someone chooses to wear his or her pants, I think we can all agree that sagging pants don't determine one's access to a college education and it will have little bearing on achieving a positive outcome if one should encounter the police. And even if it does have a bearing on those outcomes, the more important point is that it shouldn't. Mm. Right? The police shouldn't just treat you well because you have a college degree and you're articulate or whatever. We don't know, on the other hand, what to do with an image like this. What do you do with the image of the sagging pants protester? <clears throat> the move on one hand is to discredit this kind of protest because it's not respectable. But there are a couple problems. One is that we've unfairly com conflated civil rights era activism with respectability. Right? Now, it's not fair to either generation. One, because many students took time off from college to get in the streets to fight, mm. even when they were doing nonviolent forms of, um, of, of action against segregation. And it wasn't considered a respectable thing to do, particularly for the first generation of black folks to have broad access to college. Mm. Call home and tell your parents, you know, I'm just gonna need to go down to Birmingham, one of the most violent places in the country, and face down some hoses for freedom. Mm. It's not what your working class mama and daddy fought for you to do. Right, so that's not a respectable move, even though it seems like it is. But also, we labor under the assumption that rage is not a reasonable response mm. to systematic and continuing trauma, mistreatment, and injustice. And in particular, 
We don't assume that black men who look like this and whose underwear we can see have any level of political consciousness or critique, mm -hmm. right? And so this picture asks us to come to a different conclusion. And we can map all kinds of intentionality onto them, because certainly these were the folks that probably were called looters and thugs uh, in Ferguson. But we, but we have made the false assertion that these folks won't do anything meaningful with their lives until they pull up their pants. Mm. And this is not true. Now, so I, I wanted you to have a genealogy of sagging pants, and I wanted you to think about the sort of illogics that attend to it in a respectability conversation. Um, but I want to then move to three moves that I think can help us to think about the pleasures of resistance um, and the place of the ratchet uh, in light of this genealogy and in light of the schisms. And what I want to do is to, is to think about what it might look like to declare the end of respectability what doing that might make possible, right? Because this, this is one mark of the end of respectability, right? That our freedom fighters aren't going to necessarily look like people in suits and ties. That doesn't make them less freedom fighters, right? Or less interested in changing the system. And then how might we build theoretical formulations that deal with these matters with a certain level of rigor? So let me begin at another place that I think is the end of respectability. So this is one end. This kind of thing right here is one end. Here's another. <laughs> the rumors and speculations about Bill Cosby's propensity for sexual assault have lingered for more than two decades. And though accusations against him go back to as early as 1966, so 50 years, We didn't begin paying attention to those accusations until Hannibal Burris, another male comedian, ripped Cosby in late October and called him a rapist in a comedy routine. At that moment, a whole host of women began to come forward. I think the number is now numbered at over 30, who have publicly accused Cosby of drugging them only, like Beverly Johnson, or drugging and then assaulting. The number of accusers alone are enough to give us pause. And I know that it really upsets people when I talk about Bill Cosby. Now part of that is that I don't care, right? Because I want them to be as upset about the pervasiveness of raping women mm. and of rape in general as they are about their TV icon. Mm. So I, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy. And I say that as a Cosby Generation kid. Mm. Right? I grew up watching the Cosby Show every Thursday night with my mom. I'm like Rudy Huxtable's age. <laughs> I remember, I, I was a little young when the show came on, but I absolutely remember when it went off, Bill and Sad in April of 1992, as we watched Bill and, I mean, watch Claire and Cliff dance off into the audience, into the sound stage. But here's, Here's what I wrote recently in a column about Bill Cosby and about what he means for respectability that I think is really important. Since 2004, in his infamous pound cake speech at Howard University, my alma mater, Bill Cosby has gone around the country lecturing to poor black people about our failure to uphold our end of the bargain. That's almost a direct quote. Poor people have failed to uphold their end of the bargain. A Faustian bargain, if ever there was one, the idea that being respectable citizens with good families would pave the path to freedom has proved to be simply untrue. Since the Cosby Show came on the air in 1984 and 2007, we have watched black people, we watched the wealth gap grow, so black people have lost wealth in that time period. And that was before the crash of 2008, when we then lost another half of our wealth. Those are structural challenges. Meanwhile, Cosby has 
lived a lie. He has asked us to invest not only in the lie of his own life, but in the larger lies of black respectability and patriarchy. His own crimes, and I, and I, and I do think he's guilty and he's not going go to go to, go to court. He's not going to be convicted. So I think in the court of public opinion, I'm, I'm willing to declare him guilty. And I'm doing that as a form of allyship with survivors. Yes. Because when women say that they have been raped, and more than 30 women say it, I believe them. And if you don't, you got a problem. And I'm telling you so to your face. Don't care if you like it or not. His own crimes demonstrate in black and white the disease, the misogynistic, violent thinking at the heart of patriarchy. And as much as I might love the Cosby Show, we should perhaps consider it fruit of the poisonous tree. Mm. So I argue that we ought to slay our patriarch and our matriarch and make room for some new ideas about what black life and black family can be in the 21st century. Now I recognize the violence of this proposition. I recognize that it feels violent to those who looked at a television and for the first time saw a family that looked like themselves. I recognize that it feels extreme for those who saw a black family and felt like it was a family to which they could relate. Now here's the thing, my family didn't look anything like this, so I was like, just me and my mama. Okay. And all my cousins and my grandmama, right, I grew up in one of those kind of black families. So the cousins were just fictional people on TV, funny fictional people. People I wanted to meet up every week and see what was happening. But I didn't mistake their lives for mine. And I didn't, trust me, I didn't mistake my daddy for Bill Cosby <laughs> for Cliff Huxtable, right? And while we watched this show, the man at the center of it, the man for whom it is named, allegedly victimized and terrorized more than three dozen women. And those are just the ones that have come forward. That has to matter. And it cannot matter simply in terms of criminal justice. It's a question about where our emotional and affective and representational investments lie. Mm. That well, part of the way that we find ourselves investing in people that are violent and dangerous and don't mean us any good is because culture plays on our most deep emotional and affective desires to participate, to be in certain kind of families. So folks know that if you pathologize black people for 50 years, post Moynihan, and tell them that our families are fucked up because there's no father at the head of them, and then you put a great black family mm. on TV and say, see, this could be you. You compel an emotional investment because nobody wants to be deemed pathological. And so then we'll invest in this guy even when we, because look, we're investing in this character because of the man Bill Cosby. And we do conflate the two. We always have. We've been asked to. He's asked us to. He used his speaking tour as Bill Cosby based on his work as Cliff Huxley. Right? And I'm saying that there's a cost to that level of investment in respectability and in patriarchy. There are material costs to those investments, to the investment in respectability politics, to the, to the investment in heteronormativity, Right? Mm -hmm. To the investment in a notion of black exceptionalism. Right? Our love for the Cosby Show harkens back to the political project of respectability, namely to show that African Americans are fully capable of being normal, nuclear, and heteronormative. And in many ways, the runaway success of the Cosby Show marks the cultural apex of the project of respectability. But we should measure this against the fact that in the very same moment that we were reveling in Claire Huxtable, the attorney, the you know, bilingual, you know, mother of five, new partner in a law firm, doing it, right? That in the cultural sphere, we had Claire Huxtables. <laughs> so Anita Hill accused Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment. And 90% of black people supported Clarence Thomas. Did y'all know that? Because y'all know how much we despise Clarence Thomas now? Well, when he was being nominated to the Supreme Court, Anita Hill was supreme race trainer. 
seems like there's a cautionary tale there that if you don't listen to the women, none of us do well. <laughs> Real talk, because he has, he has been the deciding vote to roll back every piece of civil rights legislation that we have had. There are material costs to our investment in patriarchy. And Lonnie Guinier was nominated by Bill Clinton to be assistant attorney general in 1993, and she got called a quota queen by the right riffing on the welfare queen. So they totally the ambassador, killed her credibility, said she was, you know, just trying to create a world in which blacks could govern blacks in an affirmative action. Uh, well, and it was really a backlash against affirmative action because she was a strong supporter. So they said she believed in quotas for affirmative action, which is probably a narrative that you've heard trickle down to you. Uh, and it was it was it was a falsity then, and it's a falsity now. She believed in the she she opposed quotas, but was a robust supporter of affirmative action. And so, part of the takedown of affirmative action in the modern moment has been on the basis of totally mischaracterizing the intellectual labor of another black woman scholar. And now we're watching it again, cause we can't get Loretta Lynch confirmed as attorney general. But those women are Claire, I mean, they're like what Claire Huxley would be like in real life. And I would submit, if we think about Anita Hill, that the many women who have come forward against Cosby have been accused, like she was, of trying to just take down a big black man. Mm. What about his legacy? What about all of us who went to black colleges because of a different world? But I'm going to suggest that it's Cosby and not these women who has disrespected the legacy of all the black men who were lynched because of false allegations made by white women. He actively played into the stereotype and myth of the black male rapist and his heinous, sexist, misogynist acts can't be dismissed because of racism. So don't blame the victims for perpetuating the stereotype, blame his ass. What then do we make possible when we declare death to respectability? Because what I'm saying to you is the respectability political project has failed. It has failed. We have degrees and suits and we're articulate and we can get into the halls of power except when we can't. And black boys are still getting killed in the street. So where do we go from there? Towards righteousness. <laughs> you know what's coming. So what do I mean when I say ratchet? Ratchetness refers to a range of African American working class practices that exceed the bounds of respectability and propriety. They find their articulation in excess and being <laughs> extra, doing the most and achieving the least, mm. as my homegirl would say. Uh, in stretching notions of propriety until they snap and break, and then reveling in snapping off, breaking off, breaking you off, breaking it down, mm. and all the kinds of cultural practices that these moments signify and allow for. Now, part of the reason I work on ratchetness is because the current iteration of that term was invented in one of my two hometowns, Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm. In 1999, in a song from Anthony Mandigo called Do the Ratchet. Uh, now, it was a dance. It was a dance. And because I'm limited on time, I won't play, but you can look it up. It's Anthony Mandigo and Boosie, Lil Boosie. And their song is called Do the Ratchet. It came out in 2004, the readings. So the ratchet was not merely a categorization, but rather an action or a way of performing. Uh, and it made the rounds in local Louisiana music, including songs by Lil Boosie, Webby, and Hurricane Chris. And these, these days in popular court parlance, people use ratchetness interchangeably with the ways in which ghetto used to be used pejoratively. Um, yet my little cousin, who is from Shreveport, uh, explained to me years ago, and I was like, what's ratchet? Because you know, I had moved away by me. So I was like, what is this? And he was like, well, it's ghetto all the way turned up. It's ghetto on steroids. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, we needed that. Like, you know, a little respectability peep right out. So I was like, what? 
Um, but it marks a different kind of boundary. And where many of us have some connection to the ghetto or the projects, um, that doesn't, all that flows out of those spaces is not necessarily ratchet. Ratchet is a kind of hustling sensibility in that it is hard working in both its pursuit of resources and pleasure. It has a kind of don't give a fuckness about it that is a bit different from being ghetto in the sense that ghetto-ness feels to me uh, like it has a self-conscious sense of its own alterity. Wretchedness is unapologetically, unselfconsciously different, and it figures problems not as a problem of the ratchet, but as a problem of the power structure. So I want to get out of this PowerPoint and show you real quickly like my absolute most favorite ratchet moment ever. <laughs> <laughs> this is when Hurricane Chris, who is from Shreveport, goes down to the Louisiana State Congress. No poll. Stop. That is not right. <laughs> One second. Um, he goes to the Louisiana State House. So immediately, folks were like, what about her kid? She's a mother. 
mothers should do whatever. And the thing that I want to ask people, whenever they say this about Amber Rose or Beyonce or whomever is, so your argument is that black grown woman sexuality is a danger to children. <laughs> That's your argument. Okay. So how do we get to this gendered notion of the ratchet? Um, so that we malign her, but we embrace Kanye so much so that this became a joke at the Grammys when he jumped on the stage to do this to Beck this year. But let me begin again with the genealogy, which is to say, or to, to go back to the genealogy. One thing to note about the genealogies of Ratchet, and in particular of twerking the dance that is seen as like the sort of sidekick to Ratchetness, um, is their gender dimensions. So in the 1990s, in the early 2000s, um, men, well, when I was growing up in Louisiana, men twerked. Um, and so that, you know, what now we consider that a challenge to, to heteronormative forms of masculinity, but, you know. But in the cultures where these terms are created, men twerk, they dance. Uh, and if you look at the original Boosie track of the Do the Ratchet, the chorus is he ratchet, she ratchet. We all got some ratchet in us. So, how then does twerking and ratchetness get gendered as female, black and female? Well, part of this, I think, is about the leg legibility of black female bodies in this moment as excess excessive and as inflected through stripper culture and Amber Rose used to be a dancer. So, when understood uh, in the context of what ratchetness does, that part of what ratchetness does is it turns us to notions of the body. And so there's a way that we care about uh, black female embodiment and the regulation of black female embodiment in a respectability project that is a bit different from dudes. So with dudes, it's pull your pants up, but it, with women, it's you know just keep your clothes all the way on and don't be sexual at all. There's not the same sexual policing of men in respectability. People expect them to be sexual, they just want them to be buttoned down in a suit and tie. <laughs> um, and so ratchetness and twerk uh, point us to the booty, like Amber Rose does. Um, and that taken together with strip club culture uh, has participated mightily in a reframing of the ratchet as something that is heavily uh, performed and laid over the black female body. I can say more about that question and answer. But I do want to ask, What is possible if we embrace an image like this? Right, if we see the pleasure and joy in it, uh, rather than if we see it only as a, a mode of propriety. Part of the reason that we're so afraid of black women's asses is because we associate them or we think of them as archives of pain and archives of a history of sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. And we think of them as rooted to a history where black women aren't respected and are vulnerable to being raped. But part of what I'm saying is, when you think about somebody like Bill Cosby, the rapist isn't always a racist white man, right? So that's one thing. Two, the rapist isn't always some monster that you have no control over, somebody that you know. So we're not necessarily protected because of how we police our bodies, and that's a thing we already know. But two, what happens if we think about black female bodies and booties as archives of pleasure? What if we're able to think about that as a resistant strategy, to resist the overlay of those histories of trauma always onto the body? See, this is part of the reason I wanted to talk about this in a moment where we're experiencing new trauma. That part of what trauma does is it limits our own sense of entitlement to pleasure, right? It limits our sense that we have the right to be frivolous or to show our bodies or to do anything that implicates us in a project where people will not see us as fit for citizenship. But when black women are all buttoned up like Anita Hill and Lonnie Guineer and Loretta Lynch, they still don't get to the places they're going any more than when they're dressed down like this, right? Respectability does not get us the thing that we think it does, which is white confirmation 
of fitness for citizenship. And so when others say, look, I'm going to embrace the ratchet, they are in some ways exposing the limits of the respectability project. So ratchetness becomes a conduit for us to mark out a path, a path out of the strictures of respectability into a path of new possibility. And that path is, I'm sorry, before I, before I say that, I just want to show this too, right? Because it's not just a gender concept, it's also a race concept. So that Kim Kardashian does this and she breaks the internet. Amber Rose does this and she's a bad mother. Now, it's not that people respect Kim, but when Kim does things, we don't think it's going to take down a whole race of people. When Aunt Rose does things, it becomes refigured as another way that black women and their sexualities are deviant and dangerous and need to be policed. So we can use Amber Rose and other interactions or inactions of um, enactments of ratchetness as a pathway out of the strictures of respectability and into a path of new possibility. Um, and that path is marked at CFC by what I have called a kind of disrespectability politics, which is both about the endless ways in which black women's bodies are disrespected, but also about the ways in which we have come to disavow, disregard, and discard respectability politics among next generation black feminists, precisely because it does not provide us with the requisite social protections that it seems to promise, and it forecloses other expressions of black female selfhood. So even if your path out of respectability isn't to go and show your ass on a hotel balcony, I'm saying that there are other expressions of black female selfhood that the narrative of Claire Huxtable and all of her real world um, avatars um, offer. That those pathways are limited and that there should be new pathways and that ratchetness makes us uncomfortable because it forces open those pathways. So let me brush to a close by saying a little bit about disrespect how I think it shows up. And I want to say it by actually turning back to the case of Trayvon Martin. And in particular, I want to turn to his friend, Rachel Jontel. One, just look at the looks on her face. Mm. Now, Jontel became the subject of intense ridicule because she struggled to enunciate clearly, due in part to an obstruction of the jaw and perhaps also because of a learning disability when she was on the stand giving testimony about her being the final person to talk to Trayvon Martin on the phone. And for white audiences, her inarticulate speech made her untrustworthy, while in black audiences, it made her a failure in the sense that she failed to procure justice for Trayvon because she could not perform respectably enough to make the jurors see his humanity, which also asked us a question about what is black women's respectability politic in service of? Is it in service really of saving ourselves or is it always ultimately about saving black men? Mm. The strong reactions to Rachel Jontel's mode of inarticulation mask a more fundamental problem, namely, not her inarticulability, but the inarticulability of racism within our current legal and cultural frameworks. Her, at the same time, her refusal or inability to conform to accepted patterns of proper English speech infuriated many black people who knew very well what was at stake if she were deemed lacking in credibility by the jury. But I understand her refusal as the act of someone implicitly aware, even if she could not articulate it, that the game was a rigged one. Mm. That the same people who were forced because of hoodie marches throughout the country to prosecute her friend's killer were wholly uninterested in the truth she came to tell. Now, Rachel and Trey Vaughn were born in the middle of the 1990s, right around the same time that all of these other black women, Anita Hill and Lonnie Guineer and Joyce Lynn Elders, get, lamb, get, get totally skewered in the public sphere. So they're born as the project of respectability is being bookended in the 20th century. And, and so part of what that means is that they don't grow up in a world where that is seen as the only uh, pathway into some kind of freedom. In some ways, their lives mark the end of respectability. Uh, 
And in particular, her performance on the stand demonstrates that. So, like Trayvon Martin's body marked in his neighborhood, a kind of out of place black body uh, that marks the petition for sort of state sanctioned violence, even vigilante violence, her body. So there's a way that men's bodies interact in public space in a respectability regime if they use it, if they wear hoodies or they sag their pants. But there's a gendered way that black women's bodies in here in that regime. Rachel John tells dark skin, plus size, out of place body conjures narratives of welfare clean laziness, lack of ambition, and illegitimate maternity. So it indexes more discursive forms of both state violence and black vitriol hurled against the bodies of black women who appear in public space. But because black women have been some of the key theorists of respectability and its torchbearers, Rachel John Tell's large black body became the site upon which African Americans could heap all our racial anxieties about the external perceptions of what my friend K.S.A. Lehman has called the worst of white folks, right? In other words, in a disrespectability regime, so Trayvon Martin is wearing a hoodie at night. And in some ways, we recognize that as not being a respectability <coughs> politic. He's not dressed up and, and particularly attentive to what he's wearing. And so we don't blame him for that. We're out in the streets for that. But when this girl gets on the stand and is not interested in playing the game, she gets completely lambasted. Right? So his performance of disrespectability makes us march. Hers makes us cringe and cuss and call her out. Rachel knew that she would be perceived as suspect, and she responded to the distrust and mis to the distrust by mirroring back to these white prosecutors the mistrust and suspicion of them that they mirrored to her. She also possessed what I think of as a sort of unsuspecting acuity, a kind of cultural deafness and perspicacity about the operations of white racism and power that made her really difficult to pin down in the courtroom. Forced to testify what amounted not to the trial of her friend's killer, but rather to the trial of her friend, Rachel Jonto met the disrespect she sensed with an unapologetic use of disrespectability politics. So in this instance, disrespectability politics references a persistent, cultural regime that tacitly and openly treats black women and all black people with contempt and disdain simply for being black and female. Our bodies are seen as infinitely disrespectable quantities, as a kind of cultural site where the refuse of racialized pity, resentment, anger, and fear, in addition to fetishization, fetishization and, and exoticism can be piled high. Disrespectability not respectability, is a more true account of black women's experience of what Anna Julia Cooper called long, dull pain in the US. Despite how respectable <coughs> we may be, or may not be, or be interested in being. <coughs> Excuse me. So, up for me and the reason I wanted to put her in this conversation is that her resistance to the powers that be and their sense of performance, she recognized that they didn't want to convict this woman. <coughs> she didn't buy in. And so we, we culturally hated her for that. But in many respects, given the string of non-indictment since the moment, she proved to be a bellwether uh, rather than someone who, who didn't get it right. So I think that the kind of work in this moment that she does is only possible, right? So what she does is she gets up, she testifies for her friend, and that's the most important thing she does. She makes an argument that he's human, that he wasn't up to any no good uh, that night. Sorry, uh, almost done. Uh, she makes an argument that he's not up to no good, and she's able then to give back to us a view of him as human, uh, and as a, as a teen boy just caking on the phone with his homegirl, right? 
And so that does important cultural work, even though she's not able to pull it out in terms of the legal case. And I think that, that we have to acknowledge that that kind of cultural work is only possible when we throw off the strictures of respect, respectability. Um, and it comes with the wholesale recognition that disregarding racial convention and dissing respectability is sometimes the very best way that we can show regard and respect for black life. That's it. Respectability, but you didn't say where you stand. 
what do you think is the solution of uh, uh, problems facing black people? Uh, I don't know that I'm the person that should answer that question. I think that's part of the problem is that we think that there is one answer. Um, I think that black folks should fight like hell uh, for freedom. And I think, um, I think we shouldn't take uh, Mr. State mistreatment. And so part of my investment is I'm not here for respectability politics. I want to be very clear. I'm much more an aficionado of ratchetness, even though I'm a respectable professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you get in my car on any given day, what you're going to hear is the most ratchet music you can find, and that's just what's true. Um, what, I'm, what I'm really interested in saying is, at most, respectability should be a tactic. In the 19th century, respectability was a tactic for those folks. They didn't fully believe that it was going to solve the problem. They knew who should be solving the problem. But they didn't have the power to make the government do anything. So they did the next best thing. right? Whereas we come out of a legacy of the 60s where we were able to force the state to make some shifts. And so we should be thinking more broadly about systemic change and not about self-regulation. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't think there are some internal community conversations to be had about an ethic of love and about violence. But I do think, like, when we talk, for instance, about black on black crime, right, that if we, people had jobs and they weren't stuck in concentrated areas of poverty, that you would see a reduction in crime, right? Because I don't concede what is at the base of that assertion about black on black crime, that black folks are just inherently more violent than everyone else. What I know is that they're inherently more deprived, systematically deprived, right? And so that means that that has to be the focus of what we do. And very often, respectability politics just tells us that the sole goal is to become the exceptional black person who makes it out, has a lot of success, and has a seat at the table. And sometimes all the seat at the table does is give you a close-up to power, but it doesn't actually give you power to change anything. Right? And so, as a kid who grew up in a working class family where I was absolutely put forward as like the exceptional kid in my community, like that's not sufficient. right? Because I don't want to just be the only person out of my community to make it. And certainly, others have made it. But I want everybody to have a set of opportunities to make it and, and to not believe in the lie of my own exceptionalism. I don't believe in that lie. All right, all right. Um, and so, and part of what attached to the lie is like, well, see, while you had your head in the books, those other girls were having babies. Right? It's all respectability. And it's like, well, somebody. Well, my life was set up in such a way that somebody affirmed and encouraged me to read books, right? And somebody was able to regulate my time so that I was protected and so that men who were too old didn't have access to me and couldn't sexually exploit me, right? So there were some things that worked in my favor, even as a working class girl, that made it possible for me to be exceptional. There's nothing particularly special about me that other girls didn't have other than access to opportunity, right? And so I want us to have a different conversation and I think the challenge is that we too become really invested in being the only one. Like we build identity around being exceptional. Um, and part of that becomes a narrative about respectability. And so if we're gonna change things, then we gotta change that. Um, I've noticed an interesting phenomenon lately where I'll see um, people in black culture, black American culture who will, you know, speak derogatorily about um, twerking, for example, while uplifting other dances that are very similar to twerking in other black cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I see it all the time, someone who posts a video of a dance from somewhere in South America, where again, they're shaking their butts, right. and they're like, oh, well, this is so much better than twerking. And I'm wondering, what do you think, what do you think is the cause of that, where they're seeing other black cultures doing something similar and uplifting that while at the same time degrading what black America, what comes from black American culture, even though they have the same roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know, that seems a little odd. Um, but I, I mean, look, I think, that, I think that we have internalized deeply that we are pathological and that when that kind of, we, I think we think twerking and ratchet and disrespectability um, is a blight, is evidence of our failure. And I think we internalize that, and our, our first response is always to police it, right? The other thing is, I think it's also rooted in a kind of exoticizing of African diasporic folk, 
right? So it's like, oh, look at that, what they, you know, what they do over there. And there's not an implicit association. Whereas I look at those videos and I'm like, oh, this has a long genealogy. Yes. Right, look at this. We've been twerking forever. We just want that, like, that's one of those things we brought with us. Which is the other reason why I'm not letting people take it away. Right? Because I'm like, we brought this and it means something. It means something culturally and politically that we move in this way. Um, and it's citational and it's an index to a past that we don't have a lot of access to, right? So it, it becomes a bodily archive that we carry with us that I think is really important. Um, but, yeah, I think folks exoticize on the one hand and see black people in other places as, as, as other. Um, and I think we also despise our own selves because we're told every day that if black women would just twerk less, we could get free. <laughs> right? Preach, just a preach. No? Yeah. So, um, I was curious about what you said as a follow up to what just happened. Is, um, when you're talking about twerking and, and the history of it, when you talk about Louisiana, yeah. you said that um, you know, women are twerking also. Yeah. And it sounded as though things were not separated by sex and gender in the way that we now. So, I'm wondering if you have a sense of what the path was that made ratchetness associated with women and um, got men to stop doing particular things. Right. Yeah. Um, Freedom. Yeah, um, it's actually, it's a little earlier. So so I have a, a video of, like, uh, there's a DJ in New Orleans, DJ Jubilee, um, had a song in 93 where the chorus is like, twerk something, right? And so it's a video, it's all these dudes popping. And so when I grew up, you went to parties, dudes and girls competed <laughs> for who could twerk better. Um, so, but I think that what I can most associate that to so around the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, you have Goody Mob, Atlanta saying, they don't dance no more. All they do is this, right? So they're marking some kind of cultural shift. And I think that cultural shift has to do with hardening narratives about masculinity in hip hop so that, um, so that dancing is seen as like interrupting cool, the cool pose. So I mean, we've seen a narrowing in the last 20 years of the kinds of masculinity that are allowed in hip hop. So in 93, you had uh, the Far Side and De La Soul and G-Funk era. You know, like you had all of those kinds of performances of black masculinity, where now you pretty much don't. It's mostly gangsta. Like we're coming back around a little bit. But it's mostly, you know, in the late 90s, a gangsta thug, hard persona. And so you can't be a thug pee-popping at the club. It doesn't <laughs> it's kind of incongruent. Um, and so I do, so I mean, I think that we actually really did see a clear material shift in terms of the performances of masculinity that were available. Um, and, I, and I think Louisiana is an interesting space because as you're shouting out Big Frida, it is one of the places where trans hip hop artists have been a part of the culture forever. So Big Frida is new. I was like, who is Big Frida? Because I grew up with Katie Red, right? And so Katie Red was a trans rapper in New Orleans who played on the radio in the 90s regularly. Not just in New Orleans, but in the part of the state where I'm from, which is hours away. Um, and so they've always had a little, they've been a little bit different on gender. And maybe that is because they're also connected to diaspora in a particular way too. Um, and so it made sense to me that even in the early 2000s, men and women could be seen as getting ratchet, where now we mostly think about women as getting ratchet. So I think, I think it actually has something to do with the way that hip hop in particular has reshaped gender. And I think we don't give hip hop, like we think about that in pathological ways, and I think that there's something, I'm not always here for that critique, but I do think we can say hip hop has narrowed the scope of gender possibility. Yeah. How is uh, respectability connected to class, and how do you, is it just a code word for class, or how do you, how would you explain that? I'm sure. Um, it is a code word for class, one on the one hand. Um, because it is, it is, it in indexes uh, middle class aspiration among black folks. The problem is that it's not a clear demarcator of class um, because when it occurs, there's not such a, a huge gap between the black middle class and the black working class, right? They're not economically, there's not, there never has been. You know, so when you think about like, you know, so I grew up hearing stories about how, you know, doctors and lawyers lived on the streets with, with plumbers and 
day laborers and so forth. Like they all lived in the same neighborhoods. That wasn't just because of segregation, but unless you were at the upper echelons, you made roughly within the same range. I mean, black folks now have a net wealth of like eight thousand dollars. That's 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 middle class net wealth is median net wealth for black people now. In most current statistics, is about eight thousand dollars. So that's not. So if the working class are people with no net wealth and the middle class are people with $8,000, that means you're two months away, basically, depending on the part of the country, from being working class, right? So it's, so it's never been, and that's always been true. That's what's tough is that those economic markers have always been true. So part of what respectability marks is an outward performance of class aspiration that's not necessarily you can't necessarily market economically, but the folks who sort of speak a certain way and like certain things culturally are people who are aspiring to a particular thing, and the folks who don't are seen as keeping these people from getting to those places because they're, you know, so Mary Church Terrell in the 1900s would just say, look, like, you know, I mean, I hate that we have to bring them along, but people think that we're the same, so we gotta make them do better because otherwise everyone's gonna perceive us as being like them, right? Um, which is deeply, <laughs> I like Mary Church Royal, but she's really problematic on the class. So I do think it's a way of saying class, but it's more than just class because it's tied to that linked faith thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is kind of a complex question. I'm not really okay. completely sure how to uh, phrase it, but I was thinking back to what you were talking about, how um, part of where respectability politics came from, where black women are not supposed to be seen as uh, sexual comes from their vulnerability. I was wondering, do you think that is why um, black masculinity has become so limited in scope? Because the idea of them using their bodies as pleasure, and, for example, in dancing and stuff, makes them vulnerable too. And so the answer to that is to become more hardened so that you're not vulnerable to a uh, certain attack as well. I don't know. I mean, I think it's real good work for you to do. I think it's a um, <laughs> complex question. Um, cause I, because I, I actually do think black women and black men negotiate the terrain around body policing really different as we see with Kanye West or with Khalifa, who are not particularly thuggish. They're kind of roguish, but they're not thuggish. Um, and, they, and, and Kanye is not hard at all, you know, but yet he can still deploy slut shaming as a, as a way to be masculine or gain some power. So... So I don't know. I think that there, look, I, what, I'm, what makes more sense to me, and I don't do a lot of work on black masculinity because it's like my one feminist resistance to like always thinking about black men, right? <laughs> I'm just like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it, right? Like we're gonna march for y'all. Every week I'm gonna like get on white people about why they killing us and y'all in particular, but I'm like not gonna write about you in my scholarship. Um, but I do think, it's important to note that this harming of masculinity happens in culture at the exact same moment that the prison industrial complex explodes. At the exact same moment. Um, Clinton administration, primarily. So there's something about the criminalizing of black men um, in unprecedented levels, right, or levels that we hadn't seen up, up until a century before that I think is probably more related um, and frankly, I think like black women get wiped off the landscape of how dudes theorize masculinity, right? I think that we like, we like backdrop onto um, it, particularly for hetero masculinities, I mean, right? Like a, in other words, I don't think black men spend a whole lot of time thinking about us. Okay. <laughs> you know, in any critical sense, there's nothing politically that would demand that they did or culturally, like I think what black men think is like, you're supposed to be there. We expect you to be there. And when you're not there, there's hell to pay. But I think that that's like the extent of it, and I'm like very sad about that, which is why I resist writing about them in the work. Like, like, yes. yeah. Thanks so much. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a bunch of different questions, but let me just focus on one. It's okay. also a gender-related question. Uh, it seems to me uh, that what you presented in your presentation today is the, the different stakes that 
black women would have, or the different uh, consequences for black women of investing in politics of disrespectability versus the, the consequences for the black men. Um, I was wondering if you could say, say more about the, the gender differences there. Yeah, I'm primarily interested in what is the state for black women uh, in respectability. Um, because I think we are the original theorists of it. We're some of the biggest proponents of it. Um, and I think that it limits our possibilities and our selfhoods very particularly, especially in culture. So politically, I think, that, which I'll talk more about tomorrow, there's a way that respectability constrains how we protest, right? Um, but culturally, I'll give you an example. When I wrote the first piece, I wrote two pieces about Bill Cosby. And the first one was called Claire Huxtable's Dead, and I wrote it for Kirk Feminist Club. And one of my friends was so mad with me about it that she dressed up as Claire Huxtable for, for Halloween. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> Another one of my friends like, spent the whole day arguing with me, like, really, though? Really, B? Like, I don't think we're going to let her go. Like, like, they were hot with me. And I'm talking about some of these chicks are like my radical black feminist homegirls. And they were like, we're not letting Claire go. And I was like, word? And folks, you know, people came to my page and told me that Claire Huck, Cliff Huxley was their daddy. And I was like, was he? What did you do every other day of the week besides that? <laughs> OK, whatever. <laughs> like, like I said, you know. So there's like deep affective investments, right? Um, and so yeah, I, I mean, so I'm, part of what, what I'm thinking about is how does black feminism in this moment theorize respectability because it has, it's part of the genealogy of black women thinkers, right? It's one of our signal intellectual contributions. And so much of our scholarship in black feminism is limited um, by respectability politics. So like one of my, two of my friends uh, wrote this piece, Treva Lindsay and Jessica Johnson have a piece in the last issue of Meridians about Harriet Tubman um, as a sexual being. Because Harriet Tubman married a man that was 20 years her junior. Did y'all know that? Yeah. Oh, I did not. <laughs> so they were like, what would it, what, you know, where do we locate an archive of sexuality within slavery? Right? Were there orgasms in slavery? Like, did black women have orgasms in slavery? Like pleasurable orgasms. Right? Like in, like in the midst of extreme surveillance and exploitation, where do you locate pleasure? But see, you can't ask those kind of questions. If you're like, what? Slavery was us getting raped all the time. That's what it was. And don't you dare say anything else. And it's like, but black women forged the subjectivity out of that moment as well. And that subjectivity is not only rooted in trauma. And so how do we not disrespect the trauma, but say there is more to the story, right? And so how do we not disrespect our traumas, but say there's more to the story? Right, so we don't have to be Amber Rose about our sexuality, but can we be sexual at all? Can we be sensual at all? Can we be embodied? Right, can we be fully embodied black women and what does that mean to bring our bodies into the conversation? I mean, I don't think that it's the same set of stakes for black men at all. Um, I think they have stakes, stakes around violence uh, amongst themselves in particular and policing. Um, and around people talking to them about sagging pants. But frankly, the consequences for sagging your pants, which they've been doing for 25 years, is not, are not the same as the consequences for showing your ass, right? You're not called a danger to the community when you sag your pants. Just like a nuisance that we wish would get your life together. But you are a black woman in control of your sexuality, and you're called a danger to children. What about the kids? Every time Beyonce performs, what about the kids, though? <laughs> Don't you think she has some responsibility to the kids? No, I think you have responsibility <laughs> to kids. And I think she has responsibility to her kid. And I think if you don't want your kid watching Beyonce, then put them to bed, right? That's what I think. Like, I don't think, because the other argument makes less sense to me that grown black women being grown endangers children's sense of selfhood, right? We grew up with Madonna. We grew up with Janet Jackson getting a clip piercing, and we're fine, <laughs> you know? So, and getting on Oprah at three o'clock in the daytime to talk about it, and we're fine. 
And I say to people, like, we're not the first, like, these kids are not the first generation of folks that grow up with videos. We are. I grew up watching BET and MTV. And I'm fine. I mean, most of the time. <laughs> most of the right? So I just, I feel like people take really easy arguments, and I don't, no, I just think they need better arguments. I just, I just don't find them compelling. And I think we're invested in them because we think they will get us to a political future that is, one, not a political future I think we all want, and two, um, not, it's not a political future that we can ever have. Like, I, don't, I think it just keeps receding from the background. We keep trying and trying and trying. And it's like, well, let's imagine something. One where we don't all have to go marching to it in our suits and our button downs with our corporate college degrees. And what does that look like? I had a question that probably is more relevant to tomorrow's discussion mm -hmm. because it centers around the uh, performance, performative acts within political protests. Mm -hmm. And it involves a word that isn't respectability, but it's a close cousin, it's about dignity. And one of the things in the civil rights era that was so powerful was the moral superiority of the protesters that was conveyed by their behavior compared to the anti-protesters. Uh, so they weren't just being respectable in the kind of conforming to norms. If they were being respectable, they wouldn't have been protesting, as you pointed out. But they were protesting in a way that, to the world who were spectators watching, moved people very powerfully and made the protesters the moral agents. And the word that was often used was how dignified the protesters were. And that seems um, pretty powerful. And I, but I also recognize that purely disruptive protests can also be powerful. D disruptive in the sense of, you know, destroying property. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, I'll just, I mean, Let's be undignified. I just, I think, like, yeah, like, there were limits to, hold on. One, I don't think that this group, this generation of protesters is making instead of arguments on moral grounds. I don't. I don't think that they're being immoral. I think that, right, I think that the movement is still codifying what it will be. I think it's going to have a lot of different iterations. Um, I think what we're seeing is an expression of black rage, pure and simple. Like, I think people are like, we are upset. You keep killing us. And you keep telling us that there's no room to express our emotion, right? Um, and I think that that's a different kind of argument, right? Um, that says, we, so they aren't arguing for dignity, you are right. But they are arguing for black humanity, which is also what the Dignity Project was about. And they're saying, we want you to acknowledge our humanity by acknowledging our right to be angry as fuck, that you keep on killing us. And I think part of the reason that they're not invested in dignity is because they're like, well, look how long that lasted, right? That every one of the major pieces of, of the civil rights, the civil rights um, movement that they fought for, we find in the 20th century is largely gone. They fought for desegregated schools. Schools are the most segregated they've ever been. Neighborhoods are as segregated, if not more segregated now than they were in 1965. It's why we have a gentrification problem, which is a problem of resegregation. So if desegregation was the big piece, just because we can ride on the bus next to each other doesn't mean we go to the same schools today, doesn't mean we live in the same neighborhoods today. We don't. In most urban areas, we don't. Public schools are being destroyed in major urban areas each and every day. They, I mean, our public schools are in abysmal condition. And the Voting Rights Act is not secure. <laughs> So like the major pillars that these folks fought and marched for, I'm not taking anything from them. I, they fought for it, it lasted, but it literally lasted us to the end of the 20th century. And we find ourselves in the second, of the 20, second decade of the 21st century having to re, re-litigate every single battle. That's not even just true with civil rights, it's also true with feminist battles. Roe v. Wade is in very precarious position. Women have more limited access to abortion now than they had in 1973 in many places. Um, so I think that they're saying, look, that is what you fought for. It was a strategy for your moment. It's a very different moment now, and it didn't last us very long. So now we've got to go back in and figure out how to get the schools to be good, how black people can have affordable places to live. Plus, we have a mass incarceration problem now, 
that is 100 years old when you consider the net peonage system. Those were the major parts of those. I mean, literally, I'm like, I, I, I'm not of the position that nothing has changed, but it does seem like it, it, it's the same logic in a different set of clothes, right? Or like it, it just doesn't seem as overt and now it's just harder to pin down intent, but it's not like we, we see the disparate effects everywhere. So, so I hear them just saying dignity is not the answer. Like we're not interested in you knowing that we're dignified, right? We're interested in you knowing that we are worthy of protection and so one, I mean, and they're not different than black power, the black power movement in that way. I mean, people were disillusioned with the Dignity Project in 1966. You know, I mean, Stokely and them were over dignity in 1966. That's what black power was all about. It's about saying, look, that kind of performativity is not sufficient anymore. And so I just, I'm not, I'm not invested in it. And I'm not invested in it because I'm tired of trying to prove to white people that we're human. And that's what the Dignity Project is all about. Saying, look white people, see? Really, just because they were beautiful and dignified and eloquent and elegant when they did it, doesn't mean that the fundamental thrust of what they're doing is what we should be back to. So no, no, no. I'm interested in white people knowing, come hell or high water, you're going to treat us right. And that's, that's a hard position uh, to be in. But you know, because it's sort of like how kids today on Twitter will be always like, you're tone policing, right? But I, they have this great analogy, right? Because they're like, because you know, a lot of times they'll be calling out racism. Good, well, many white people come along and be like, if you just said it nicer, people. <laughs> <laughs> right? And one of the things that they said is, look, if you're standing on my foot, I don't have to ask you politely to get off. Real talk. And the argument that when a person is doing something to actively harm you, that your responsibility is to ask them nicely so they'll hear you, is a, mis is a misplacement of where, pow where power should lie. It's like, no, no, no. If you're on my foot, get off. Move, right? Not please, can you please, please? Like, no. And there's only so, look, and anybody who's put in the position to do that, their internal dignity is eroded at some point. If you keep on having to make to submit to the notion that what the purpose of your protest is to do is to show this other group of people whose humanity is already conceded that you belong in the family of humans as well, how does that not over time erode, erode your own internal sense of dignity? So there is a cost to that, I think. Uh, and I think this generation is saying that's not a cost we're willing to pay. Y'all have to change. And we're not going to back off until you do. Um, and, you know, and, and so it's hard because I don't want to knock my elders because I think that they fought the battle in the way that made the most sense for the times that they encountered. But I give no fucks if white people think I'm dignified or not. I just don't. And that's the most blunt way. Yeah, I give no fucks. <laughs> is that crumb? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so uh, we are a little over time. Thank you very much. I want to remind everybody.